All right. Welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools. I'm so excited that we found time to have both Trisha and I on the podcast today. I know, I don't know what it sounds like uh, to listeners on the other end, but we go through these times, Trisha, where we get to do a lot of them together and then our calendars don't match up because we're both consulting in other places. So we do some (laughs) by ourselves. Uh, So it's always great when it feels like it's been a long time, even though it might not seem that way to listeners uh, that we've been on a recording together. But I'm so excited for our guest today, Dimitri, uh, and we get to talk a little bit about information in media literacy. Dimitri Pavlonis is the Director of Research and works as the Digital Literacy Program Manager at Civics. Civics is the organization you're going to hear us talk a lot about. We dig into just two of their many, many programs. They've got a lot of free support out there for teachers, which we appreciate. They happen to be a Canadian civic education charity who's dedicated to building the habits of active and informed citizenship among school-aged youth through experiential learning programs. We talk a lot about what it means to cultivate citizenship, both in the broad sense of the world. And then Jeff, we also look at it really like in micro, like what does it mean to actually look at some very small moments where we can practice citizenship with our friends and our family. So um, I love that we zoom way out and then we zoom way in in this conversation. Uh, And I think we also have a lot of great examples of how you can play around with information and media literacy so that students have multiple rehearsal moments, right? I don't get Mm. one lesson or have one day uh, a week where, okay, now I understand information literacy. It's a, a whole broad skill set that I have to practice and rehearse. And as Dimitri points out, it's uh, it, it's evolving as our technology is evolving too. Anything else you think that listeners should be looking out for in our conversation today, Jeff? Yeah, I think my favorite part is just what you said is the, this is why we love podcasting and why we love talking to other people is we end up just bouncing around some ideas based off of one of the, uh, one of the programs that Civic has. Uh, He starts talking about it. And then the three of us just kind of bouncing, like we could take this idea and you could do this with it and you could do that with it. Uh, So just a lot of great, I I think just great ideas like brainstorming. Uh, And my hope is, is that listeners can maybe brainstorm along with us of what would this mean like for their classroom, their, their students, as we talk about, you know, the importance of media literacy and and really digging into this idea of citizenship. Uh, I think there are, are great conversation around just citizenship and engaging students in civil uh, civil conversations, I think is critical on um, where we are today. Uh, we finish up the podcast and Trish, I'll let you talk about this, but we kind of, we really, really dig into some AI stuff at the end, I think, which was really interesting for listeners as well. Yeah. I think information literacy is only going to become increasingly more and more critical, um, with AI becoming ubiquitous. And so we talk about what that means. Um, and, and again, I think just focusing in on ensuring that information literacy is interdisciplinary. It's not just the job of the language arts teacher. Um, you know, I think Demit- Dimitri points us to how we can be thinking about that regardless of what it is that we teach, because we are all teachers of media and information literacy. Yeah. Great episode. Uh, get ready for this one. I think you're going to really like it. It's uh, a great conversation. Again, to like Trisha said, we we zoom way out and then we zoom way in and talk about some examples. And make sure that you go check out civics.ca. That's C-I-V-I-X.ca. Uh, all kinds of free resources over there that Dimitri and his team are, are pu- putting out. So uh, just some really great stuff and a great conversation today. So hope you enjoy this one. And with that, on with the show. Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us. There's a lot that I want to get into. There's so many different incredible programs from civics. So listeners, I'll say right from the start, what you hear us discuss is really just the tip of the iceberg. Please do learn more about the lengthy list, uh, the incredible menu that civics has. 
I'd love to start our conversation oh. looking at the civics program CTRLF, which, again, quoting from your website to giving folks a flavor for it, is, quote, named for the keyboard shortcut for find. CTRLF is an evidence-based program that equips students with the habits and skills needed to evaluate online information to determine what to trust, end quote. Dimitri, can you tell us more about that program and um, what it means for educators to explore it and to use it in their classroom and I, I think even in their personal lives too. Yes, yeah, so like you said, so control F. So this is, I think this is um, a symptom of us being in more of a uh, Mac oriented uh, landscape now or um, so when we came up with the name, we're like, oh, control F, but it's, um, but of course, if you have a Mac, it's command F. So we need we need the two we need the two names. But yeah, it's, it's a digital literacy program, like you said, for primarily for grades seven to twelve. But um, it's really about trying to empower teachers to teach students how to distinguish between um, to navigate all information, to distinguish between true and false. But much more importantly, how to navigate all that you know misleading, emotionally charged, or agenda driven information that falls into that gray area between true and false. And so I think we're at a point now where we realize that. Um, you know, the information ecosystem is not what it used to be, but it's also not what we were worried about in 2016. It's actually much more complicated, um, in some ways, much more treacherous, much more polluted. And, you know, the things that we find online are um, much less black and white than maybe we thought back in the day where, you know, the the one that always comes to mind is, you know, did the, did the Pope tell people to vote for Donald Trump? It's like, we're that's that's a type of uh, disinformation, but that's not really reflective of the types of things we're seeing today, which are so much more complicated. Um, so that's really what the the Control F program is is trying to address. And um, yeah, and for us, you know, we're a civic education organization. So for us, this is really a civic issue. It's a problem of informed citizenship within a democratic society. You know, as we or, or our students turn to information online to help them, you know, shape the decisions they want to make for themselves or for their communities. Um, we want to sure, ensure that they have the best possible tools to make the best possible decisions for them or for their communities. And so that's really what we're hoping to do with this program. And so for this, um, we collaborated very closely with um, Mike Caulfield, who you and your listeners may be familiar with. He's out of the University of Washington. He's a digital literacy expert uh, who pioneered um, kind of the shift, uh, sorry, the SIFT method of, of lateral reading. Um, and so it, our program is kind of a lateral reading based program. Um, and it's, it's really about kind of equipping students with those fundamental skills, ones that, um, they're often not taught, um, ones that teachers aren't often aware of, um, and ones that, you know, that often lead them astray. So we're trying to move them away from that to something that actually reflects better both the digital ecosystem and the realities of how we encounter information today. Can you talk a little bit more about that kind of idea for our listeners out there if they haven't heard uh, of the Sith, Sith uh, method? Can you maybe just kind of break that down for educators on what, what, what does that look like for them in the classroom? Sure. So at, at kind of the heart of it is this idea of lateral reading, which was this term coined by um, folks at the Stanford History Education Group. Um, and really, it's the idea that, you know, typically, whenever we used to encounter information or, or how a lot of people are taught to encounter taught to encounter and evaluate information is to immediately start applying, you know, those close reading skills, looking closely mm -hmm. at the information. Um, but often, uh, and especially when the stuff you're looking at is intended to deceive you, perhaps, or mislead you, um, those skills backfire again and again. And so this idea of lateral reading is to, you know, get off the page, you know, um, open a new tab, whether kind of literally or not, um, and do some kind of external context seeking. Mm. Um, and you, so you can do that in, in some different ways. You know, you can um, evaluate the source. You can kind of do a little bit of research to find out who the source is, what, you know, what is it that I'm actually looking at? Who is it coming from? Do they have an agenda? Um, you can check the claim. So you can, again, run a search to see if the claim has been reported on, perhaps by a source that you are familiar with and that you do trust or that you know is trustworthy. And you can also um, kind of use these skills to, you know, trace the information back to the source. Because as we know, so much gets used out of context or, you know, as through a game of telephone, context gets distorted as, as things move online, put in context that it's, it's not really, that don't really represent um, the original, especially this happens all the time in terms of quotations, you know, when something is clipped and it is made, it is suggested that somebody is saying something that in context is not quite what they were saying. And so it's, again, using basic search skills to 
to try to really, you know, tease out the context around what it is that you're looking at. And then once you have that context, um, then you can start applying your critical thinking skills if it's something that you think is worth your time. Mm. Um, I think that was, that was when we were talking with Mike, uh, that was one of the biggest insights I think that we've learned, right, is that he differentiates between um, critical thinking and critical context. Mm. And really, you need that critical context in order to enable actual critical thinking. I love that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what we try to do through these, through this program and through these skills. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, when I, if we're thinking about the way in which most folks are now getting their news through social media, I think there is a real almost trap in just seeing the headline and thinking, you know, the whole story. And I feel like for anybody who's spending enough time on social media, headlines now are just almost um, inundating us with just so many different, you know, be <laughs> outraged, be terrified, so be angry. Um, and I think this idea of when you notice that emotional manipulation, it's almost a signal to you to investigate a little bit further. Um, I think an interesting <laughs> experiment to do via a tool like ChatGPT is ask it actually to generate um, a few catchy headlines or clickbait headlines and notice how it evokes different emotions um, right there as well. I, I'm wondering if that's a part of, you know, the work that civics believes in is, is just understanding, sure, emotions is going to, you know, drive clicks and we need to kind of step back and be a little bit more aware of why does it want me to feel so angry or outraged or <laughs> fearful? Yeah, right. Absolutely right. Because again, we're doing everything through a civic and citizenship lens. And so you inevitably have to talk about politics and the work we do. And that is very much how politics operates, right? Politics can be very emotion driven. And it's very important that we can start at that, you know, start with the human, start with the emotions. And, um, you know, Control F itself as a program is very much focused on skills, but it does, you know, but we have kind of other programs that surround it that are very much about exactly what you're talking about that, um, yeah, that the information that's coming to us, it is trying to, you know, often trying to persuade us, trying to evoke our engagement, trying to evoke our emotions in some way. And um, at the very least, we can kind of, you know, develop some maybe metacognitive skills to know when, you know, to at least identify when we're falling into that trap. And also, you know, I think to kind of go back to what you said to, you know, that because it is trying to, you know, get, get us to engage that it's okay if we don't engage with everything. And I think sometimes, you know, especially when you think about, older pedagogies, um, you know, you want to encourage students, you know, be curious, engage, look closely at things. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't really reflect the situation we're in when there, we just can't possibly engage closely with everything that comes our way. And so it's, it's okay to do not engage with the thing that you know is going to make you angry. Yeah, yeah. And that's, or I would even say like, one of the things is like just looking at content, right? And I, I keep coming back to, I mean, one of the things that I've done with, with students and I continue to do with educators as well is just open up any of your social media account and just look how much of it is advertising. I love doing this with students, especially in Instagram. And you can start, I mean, to me, it's a great math lesson. Like what is the percentage of adverts that you are getting? Because again, you don't need to have these close reading strategies. You just need to know what are ads and what aren't ads. <laughs> and that by itself is a critical, to me, to me that's critical information in a literacy, in a in media literacy world mm -hmm. of just knowing what to pay attention to because there is so much what is worth paying attention to, I think is a really essential question that we can get kids to start asking themselves and what's worth scrolling past because you mm -hmm. know, it is an ad or it says sponsored link, or it says, you know, that it, you know, that it's trying to evoke emotion uh, to get you to stop the scroll uh, to, to engage with it. And I think that's a really interesting, just kind of, you know, mental skill to be, to be working on ourselves. Yeah. And, and kind of on the flip side of that too, it's, you know, sometimes you see things that, um, you might think aren't worth engaging with, but that actually are. And so one of the yeah. ways that this comes up a lot with students is um, we find that, you know, students are kind of, they're really attuned to at least their definition of bias and they're kind of obsessed with bias mm. um, without really kind of understanding that, you know, like kind of once any data is processed and interpreted, it is biased by nature and, you know, choices mm. were made, some parts were highlighted, others were ignored. And it's really inevitable, no matter how much we try to employ due diligence. Um, you know, but that's fine. The students just need to kind of understand, that, you know, the bias is part of the context. But sometimes what happens is that they kind of take that to an extreme. If they get a whiff of any, you know, left or right bias, automatically yeah. that thing is irrelevant. It can, it, it's 100% garbage. It's not good. And so 
the things we want to ask them to do is, you know, step back and think about the distinction between, you know, bias and agenda. Mm. Um, we think that's a, a useful place to start where it's okay. What is, so instead of asking, is this biased first ask, you know, what is the agenda of this piece? What is it trying to get me to do? Is it trying to get me to buy something? Like is it earnestly trying to inform me? Maybe if it's earnestly trying to inform me, you can give it a little more grace with how you, you know, mm. how you, how you deal with it. And then, you know, you can, you know, you can, you can identify, you know, the specific, maybe political lean in, in a piece, but if that's coming to you from, you know, a reputable journalist who you're sure does their due diligence, that's a different type of object than, yeah, than the ad or then the thing produced by the advocacy group who is, you know, whose job it is, is to persuade you because that's what they're paid to do by their clients, right? Those are completely different, different things. We want to deal with bias differently in each, in each situation. Well, and having those more nuanced conversations, uh, you had referenced a little bit earlier, another of civics programs, uh, Polytalks, which again, quoting from the website, supports educators in bringing political discussions to the classroom. It has a whole range of different resources and tools, of course, that are leaning into, Jeff and I talk all the time about how important listening skills are to be explicitly taught. So we're really excited to learn more about this program and again, how it's trying to help students and educators engage in really thoughtful conversations about complex topics. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what educators can expect to find when they're exploring your Politox resource? Sure. Yeah. And again, you know, control F is very, you know, as I mentioned, like very skills focused. Um, but as we were saying, you know, that's really only part of the problem. So I see this, you know, Polytouch is kind of a standalone program, but also one that complements control F very well, since it, it, it's what brings this human element into the picture. So as you said, yeah, it's really about helping teachers facilitate constructive discussions in the classroom, especially around uh, political or controversial issues. Um, you know, there's, there's a ton of research um, demonstrating the benefits of discussing controversial issues in the classroom. Um, and, you know, it's really important to remember that the classroom can be a really humanizing space. And, and for a lot of students, it might be the only place where they encounter in real life in a meaningful way people who are different from them or who think differently from them. And so we want to take advantage of those affordances of the classroom. But um, at least what we've been hearing from teachers is that this work is becoming increasingly challenging um, for, you know, myriad reasons. And so this program is really about helping create kind of the conditions to make effective discussion possible. Right. And of course, you know, knowing how to evaluate information and make informed opinions is, is also an essential part of that. Um, so in terms of the resources of this program, we have produced a, a handbook that's kind of ready to use for teachers with tips for preparing the classroom for discussion and some activities they can use uh, with their students, including a variety of discussion protocols. And we kind of try to outline, you know, which type of discussion protocol you might want to use depending on what your learning outcomes are for a specific discussion. Um, we also have sets of lesson plans and no matter what our program, our lesson plans all come with, um, you know, full lesson plans, slide decks, videos, activities, um, et cetera. Um, but for Polytalk specifically, we right now have um, two, two sets of lessons or at least lessons divided into two themes. So the themes are perspectives and biases. Mm. And so the perspectives lessons are lessons and activities to help students really reflect on their own beliefs and opinions and to help them take on other perspectives. Um, so one of my favorite activities from this series of lessons is a perspective taking card game that we've made. So in this case, students are given a statement. So something like, um, you know, cell phones should be banned in schools. And then they're randomly dealt three cards with specific values on them. So things like um, freedom, equality, um, security, order, et cetera. And then they have to look at the values that they're randomly dealt and determine how someone with those values might respond to that prompt. Mm. And so in this case, you know, it's, in some cases, it's kind of forcing them to take on values that maybe they don't hold or maybe they don't prioritize, but they have to imagine, okay, if this was something that I did prioritize, how would I respond to this prompt? Mm -hmm. um, and we've heard of teachers, you know, using this activity in some really creative ways and saying that, you know, after going through that type of activity, students are much more um, willing to listen to each other um, when they're discussing and disagreeing on, on pretty, some pretty difficult issues. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder with something like that, Trisha, it, that, that, I love that idea. And that just, Trisha, made me think about some of the work that you do around equity and inclusion. And I know I'm pretty sure we have a free guide somewhere where uh, the learners start with identifying what their values are and sharing those in a group session. You're going to help me remember what the free guide is. Uh, but it's like collaboration 
Oh, this something. is our collaboration recalibration guide. Yes, where before students yes, work, that that's what I'm thinking of. Before they're working on anything collaboratively, they're really thinking about you know not everybody loves collaboration and that's okay, but we think it's important to like discuss why or why not. Um, and to get to learn a little bit more about the group with whom you're working with, we also think this is great for educators who also, you know, collaboration is hard for adults too. Uh, so I, I think it's like the more often we can practice reflecting on our values and reflecting on how our identity does infuse the way in which we we learn with others, it's important because I, I think, you know, Dimitri, what you're talking about is thinking about it in light of perhaps a current issue or, um, it, you know, I worked at a school once where one of our biggest values was sustainability and we decided, okay, right. like that's also going to mean that we need to think about some things that we might have to do in terms of sacrifices. And so it was every single Tuesday was going to be vegetarian menu only. Some students got really upset about that and um, it sparked a great conversation around, but if we truly believe in this, does that mean that while some of us might not want to do this, it's one lunch, it's one lunch, one day a week. Um, and it was really great debate. And, um, you know, I, I could see what you're suggesting about, you know, that perspective switching in a context like mm. that, like being a really powerful activity to take. Yes. Like thinking about, well, you know, if I, if, if I were seven years older or younger, might my thinking on this issue be different? Um, if I were living in a place where climate change had created more damage, might I be thinking about this issue differently? So I, I think those kind of like metacognitive moves, we need to do them frequently and yeah. in so many different contexts because it, they take practice, I think. Like reflecting on your values is hard work. It's not easy. And the more often we can do it in a different way, I think the better we get at it. And I really love the example that you just gave, because I think that, I mean, right, this idea of, okay, this is our value. So what are we going to do about that? And then if, and then, you know, what are the sacrifices we actually make to live up to this ideal that, you know, making it really concrete in that way. I mean, that is, that is citizenship education. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of democratic thinking is that, yeah, it's like for democracy to work and for things to actually happen, we do have to make sacrifices. And it's, you, that example doesn't, it's not abstract. It's very easy to sacrifice things in the abstract. Yeah. Um, but well, and I was just thinking about this, like, I think this also plays into one of the things, and this is going to be kind of seem like it's out in right field, but one of the things I'm hearing from, from a lot of different groups is also around this idea of supporting, uh, especially kids who are older teenagers and getting into their twenties around relationships mm -hmm. and the relationship breakdowns we get is sometimes understanding that if we can start at a young age on understanding what are the priorities of someone else. And sometimes you have to sacrifice for others. And I think is something that really belongs inside relationships as well. Like I just, as a perfect example, my, my wife loves to have a clean kitchen. That is a sacrifice that I make because my kitchen does not need to be spotless. But I learned early on <laughs> that if I wanted to be in a relationship there were going to be certain sacrifices that needed to be made that weren't my priorities. They're not my agenda. They're not my priorities, but I am going to have to be able to step into somebody else's shoes and, and be able to lack of a better term, sacrifice something in that I've got to make sure that the, the, the kitchen is, is clean and the dishes are in the dishwasher because that is a priority for her, not so much a priority for me. And she's doing the same for me, right? That's what creates relationships. And I think anytime we can create, situations like this, where it, if it is something in group work, you know, Trisha, you're talking about group work that I might have to make sacrifices because your priorities are not the same as my priorities. And you're going to be making sacrifices for me and I'm making sacrifices for you because we've got to get the group work done in the same thing that you're talking about in this idea of what are, what are my priorities and how do I, if freedom isn't a priority I hold around cell phones, can I take that on as somebody's priority and understand that that's someone's priority because I think even as, as educators, we get into that too. I have a priority that I want no cell phones in my classroom because I control the environment. 
versus a priority of a child or the priority of the student might be, but I have a freedom and a right to be able to talk to anybody anytime I want. And that is maybe not a, <laughs> a priority that I hold as the leader of the class, right? And I think you can, you can dissect this in so many ways. Uh, and Trisha, to your point of just this metacognitive reflection on so many different levels, anytime we can bring those into our classrooms, you know, whether it be around politics or be around what are somebody trying to sell me and even into our, our personal relationships, I think is, is just really good work that we could be doing in schools. Well, the connection that you just, yeah, like from, Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go for it. Uh, well, I was just going to say. I was going to say, yeah, like for us, this is. <laughs> really, you Trisha, go. Really, really you go. Like, yeah, Trisha, Trisha you first. first. But it's, it's that piece about if we're talking about, you know, civics as a democracy building, fostering education system, like it's, Jeff, what you're saying is like at its core, it also means us practicing democracy with our friends, democracy in the yeah. house and like realizing actually that having a dem democracy is, it's built on all those small things, the negotiations, the yeah. listening, the conversations, the being together with others. So I really appreciate kind of mm. thinking about what are all of the small little details that we can build on with our friendship groups, with our families, that then, you know, it's like that exponentially grows into our neighborhood, into our schools, into our cities, so um, you know, and, and, and just bigger and bigger. But it is, where are we practicing that kind of really open, thoughtful dialogue where it's a collaborative, collective decision because uh, i think if we're saying mm -hmm. students we want you to like you know lead your country or you know lead your even just your town right how do you actually lead yeah. simply within your own household first what does that mean yeah. for you and your siblings to come to an agreement about what you're going to watch for movie night yeah. how equitable has that decision been made right yeah and it's you know, often I think, you know, when we think about schools, often it's framed in terms of an undemocratic space. This is a space where you have to go, where you're going to be forced to learn X, Y, and Z. And, um, but it can be also this space where students, and, you know, in some cases, in, in some instances, it probably has to be an under, sure. undemocratic space, but it can also be a space, yeah, to encounter these democratic values and to practice them and to try them out. Um, and, you know, and I really think, you know, you can do that with whatever you're teaching that you can, yeah, you can teach media literacy with democracy in mind. You can teach discussion with democracy in mind. Maybe that means that you favor um, constructive discussion over debate. Maybe that's what that means uh, for you in that case, right? But there is a way to kind of orient yourselves. And I think that you're teaching to exactly these democratic principles. And that's one of the, it's kind of the one, one of the things that as an organization, we truly, really try to instill in, in educators because at least in the Canadian context, citizenship, is you know across every curriculum every province every territory citizenship is stated as you know if one of the if not the goal of education yeah so true um but yet that is often lip service and doesn't necessarily get um, played out in practice or supported in practice and often the burden is on the teacher to kind of bring it into their classroom as much as they can so hopefully we can support that in, in some little ways yeah and i want to i want to just I Everything that we're talking about here, you know, this idea of citizenship, it, we know it's critical. And we also know that we are talking about a generation in our schools in most Western worlds that aren't getting these at the same rate we got them even a generation or two generations ago. I go back to the, the new research because I do a lot of work around generational relationships, right? And generational leadership now outside of education and inside education as well. But one of the things that we're seeing, especially with this next generation, is the research that just came out of Purdue University that is showing that this next generation really is struggling with behavioral issues. And we are seeing that inside the classroom. And I think you can draw this, this direct line between the behavioral class, the behaviors we're seeing in the classroom and this idea of a democratic society and understanding how do you take on someone else's compromise. And one of the things we know with this generation is they're not able as children, and there's a multiple different ways why this is happening. And I'm not going to go into them all here now, but what we're seeing with this generation is they are not having the opportunities at a young age that we had even just a generation ago to go out and learn to compromise. The thing I always bring up whenever I'm in, uh, whenever I'm talking with parents around this is even this idea of, you know, we used to play out in the yard with like eight other neighborhood kids 
And like, not just play, like mom kicked us out of the house, locked the door and we weren't able to come home. That doesn't happen with anybody nowadays, but it happened a generation ago. We weren't allowed to come home. We weren't allowed to go inside. We had, we were forced to go out and play with other kids. And then we would play the hot lava game, which almost everybody knows what I'm talking about when you say the hot lava game, but your first negotiations, your first on taking on somebody else's values is having to take something like the hot lava game. And the three of us are playing the hot lava game and we all have to come to an agreement on what is the safe base, right? What is lava? And those little things at ages four, five, and six are the building blocks for having these bigger and larger conversations. And what we're seeing is that those aren't happening for all kinds of reasons with students. So students are coming into our classrooms and they don't know how to take on somebody else's perspective. They don't know how to compromise. They don't know what it means to, oh, this is your value. How do I make sure my value and your value is heard? And we can agree that home base is going to be that chair, even though I want it to be the table. And what, do I, what is a give and take in the compromise area? And I think all of this is, this is, you're right. Like we all talk about citizenship. And then we, we're also looking at a time period where behavior is out of control with a generation. And are we actually spending the time to have these conversations in our classroom around what are your values, whether it be around politics, whether it be around cell phone in the classroom, which is a political issue inside schools, right? Like it's all these, like how are we having these conversations and not just saying we want to create good citizens, but then actually doing it, like actually having the conversations and taking the stuff that you are creating and actually bringing it into our classrooms. And you've got the card deck. I mean, we, and to your point, you know, teachers have taken this and done this in very interesting ways. It doesn't have to be done just in the context. Once you've got the card deck, you can come up with your own situation, right? With your kids in your class. Have you been seeing that? Like you said, teachers have been using this in very interesting ways. Yeah. I think one of the one of my favorite that I've heard was a, a teacher. I think she was teaching philosophy and basically she's like, okay, here's our philosophers. Which values would you ascribe to awesome. them? Love it. And then, and then how do you think they would respond to these contemporary issues given those values? And it's a, just such a great creative way to get them to think at these really high level ways about, you know, essentially what, you know, like what are these philosophers talking about? Um, but in a way that I think was still engaging for the students and didn't feel like they were doing a lot of incredibly heavy lifting mental work when they were. Yeah, I love that. Well, and we should say, you know, and I apologies, I didn't mention this at the top, like a lot of these resources that you're talking about, civics offers so much of this free. So, you know, and, and I think a lot of the free guidance that you have for teachers is only going to become increasingly more and more important because, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing folks talk a lot about now in the era of AI with it being so much easier for us to generate mis and disinformation that we might be potentially or already are facing like an infodemic or an infocopalypse is the other way I hear that phrase. Um, you know, and at the time of us recording, you just had a great piece come out in the Center for Research and Evidence on security threats about the ways in which we teach some of these skills. You mentioned lateral reading, which we know is really effective, but we've also used some other practice where, you know, as educators, we didn't have the research for this and we did it anyway. Um, and so I kind of, yeah. I feel like there's there's two things here. A, AI can make mis and disinformation easier to spread. But B, there are a few resources I've been playing around with, like chat PDF, which is great for distilling mm. research. So I kind of feel like at the same time, research is becoming increasingly more accessible um, yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on why information literacy is going to become increasingly more important. Um, and I'm wondering, do you feel like, as I just mentioned, I feel like on one hand, we, we're going to have some tools to make it easier to dig into what the research actually says, um, you know, to help educators in, in many, many ways. Because if I'm a busy classroom teacher, I don't have time to read through a 16 page report, um, but, exactly. but now I have a tool that, you know, not only summarizes it, but really breaks down some of the critical arguments. So do you feel like we are kind of on the cusp of some good and bad news or, or what are your thoughts on how AI changes the conversation for information literacy? Yeah, I think, I kind of think that's where we, we always are, especially when it comes to, to technology, right. And that our, 
jobs often as, um, you know, as people in the world are to learn how to, okay, learn, okay, here's what this technology is, here are its affordances, here's what it's good for, here's what it's not good for, and those things don't always align with what the tech companies want to tell us. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I... You know, I don't think any of the tech companies who are trying to sell this right now are probably thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to make my money because I'm going to promote this as something that helps disseminate research easily, right? That, that's probably not the top of their list, but maybe that is what this is best for. Um, so just, I guess, you know, we're talking about AI in this context. We're really, you know, primarily, I think, talking about kind of large language models, generative AI, right? So things like like chat GPT. Um, and so, and at least that's from what we hear, you know, the things that teachers and, and parents are, are especially concerned with right now. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, this is where it comes to this broader, you know, media literacy, not in the sense of just information evaluation, but really understanding what is the technical infrastructure that is driving how we encounter information and really having a, you know, a, a real chat with your students, um, maybe with parents at your school um, about what this is, how it works, even on a high level, right? We need to demystify AI, that is the number one thing I think that we need to do, right? These are, I, I don't want to downplay that these are complicated and quite impressive systems, but right, ultimately what's happening is, you know, we enter a query into ChatGPT, it runs some probability models to determine what words would most likely be used to respond to that query, right? That's ultimately what's going on. There's no actual work of creativity or synthesis going on there. Um, but, um, and we see this with humans too, you know, if it, if it says it very confidently, it sounds like it knows what it's talking about. Yeah, that's right. and, and even when I say it knows what it's talking about, um, I hate that I'm using that metaphor. <laughs> I hate that I just did that because we have to be so mindful of the metaphors we use. Mm. And so many metaphors are used around AI that try to humanize it. Um, and so this might even be a good exercise to do with students, right? Like present them with a piece of tech, tech journalism about AI and ask them to analyze how AI is discussed and framed and which metaphors are used to describe it. Mm. Right? You, you've probably seen recently that um, hallucination is being used as the term to describe what happens when the AI doesn't Lies. work. <laughs> exactly, right. And imagine if like your, if your, if your brakes have a defect and you go in the ditch and you go and, and you're like, oh, well, my, my brakes just had a leg cramp. Yeah. Like that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you should be able to hold the manufacturer accountable because your brakes had a defect. But here we just use this like cute little language. Oh, it's just hallucinating when it, it didn't work. Yeah. It told you a lie. Yeah. Um, you know, and so understanding what it is we're dealing with, that it's not magic, um, I think is really important. And, you know, I think one of the most powerful things you can do with AI as, you know, as a user or as an educator is to engage with it on something you know a lot about. Mm. Um, so if you're in class, maybe if you're, you know, you just taught a history unit, start asking it questions about the history you just learned. Um, you know, ask it things or ask students to ask it questions about things that they feel they have some expertise in. Cause then it's pretty easy to see where it's making the mistakes. Um, because you, and that you actually know more about the subject because you're the expert, right? It's, it's actually really bad for, um, it's not, it shouldn't be used to learn new information. It's actually quite useful when you're, you know, doing some brainstorming. Trish, you mentioned some examples earlier, but using it to, you know, just generate kind of clickbaity titles. That's, like, that's a great use of it. Um, but that requires you to kind of know what a clickbaity title is and be able to kind of do some synthesis on your own, right? You're not going in, you're not going in cold. So it's really, okay, how do we use this tool? It's not great for, you know, learning new information or synthesizing, but it can be useful in these other ways. And we just need to focus on, on those ways, regardless of what the tech industry is trying to sell us. Yeah. And I agree with you. And I, I think, uh, you know, I had a social studies teacher the other day that used it very similarly. They were just finishing up a unit. And so he had his students go to chat GBT and asked it to take on different personas <laughs> of uh, people that they just got done studying. And I think they, they were studying world war two. And so it was basically, you know, tell chat GBT to take on the persona of, of Churchill uh, and then have a conversation with it as if it was Winston Churchill and then start to, and then the kid's job, right, was to think about the responses that ChatGPT was giving and critically analyze that. Is this something that we know Winston Churchill would have said, or is this thing really far off and doesn't really know what Winston Churchill would do because it's just making stuff up <laughs> and it doesn't really know. Um, and then of course the kids had, this is the part I love. The kids had so much fun trying to get it to say things. And meanwhile, when you're doing that, there is learning happening. There's learning happening on what is right, what is wrong. How do I get it? How do you get it to say the thing that you want it to say or not want it to say? And all of that is the critical skills of looking at information, right? And how information can come out the other end 
and you can you can basically manipulate it to be what you want it to be. And I think if nothing else came out of it, it was just this understanding for kids. I can manipulate this thing to do whatever I want it to do. And you can. Like if you know how to ask it the right prompts, you can manipulate it to tell you everything in the world is truthful or everything's false. Or, you know, I mean it it's it's very easy to do. And I think to me that it's just another great example of, you know, there are amazing ways to use it, but using it as a this is the truth because I'm trying to learn something new for the first time is probably not the way to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think the example you gave up actually just crystallizes for me. I think it's like perfectly like what the difference is between, you know, somebody who is media literate using this tool versus somebody who isn't. So a few weeks ago, I read this piece about how some people were using, um, you know, chat GPT to allow their kids to have conversations about racism with Rosa Parks, for example. Right. Yeah. But in that case, it was just, that wrote, you ask it a question, it gives you back and you just accept it at face value. But what you're talking about is you're having this, again, like metacognitive discussion yeah. where you're reflecting on, okay, is what the AI is feeding me? Does that conform to what I have learned about this individual and how I think they would actually think like that is, and, and that facilitates such as higher level thinking that's yeah. really impressive that is, you know, technologically enabled, but you're not just, you know, you're not having this passive relationship with the, with the tech yeah. and like that. But yeah. Like, I think that is like a, that distinction for me, like in my own mind is not like crystallized. I, I'm, I'm going to probably like tell your story multiple times. Yeah. Kind of well, and it just made people. me think just as you were saying it again, I was thinking like, that's the assessment. Like, could I create an assessment as a teacher where I'm where I would say, I asked chat GPT this, this was its response that it said, Winston Churchill would have said your, the, the, the actual, assess, the actual assessment is, can you back up your idea of whether or not Winston Churchill would have like, what evidence do you have that Winston Churchill would have said this or wouldn't have said that, right? How much do you actually know the character? And this isn't, you know, I know that we don't talk about specific people this way, but you can do it around anything around. I gave ChatGPT the prompt. Here's what it gave. How do you know? How would you assume or how would you assess whether or not that is factual or not factual or what bias is in the response because we know that it gives bias responses. That to me is the assessment, right? Not the, what did it give the, are you, an, are you able to analyze the results that you got and make determinations based on your own knowledge of a subject around what it is. And I think a great way to engage students with that too is, you know, as you said, Dimitri, like start with something that they know really well. They already feel like they've got some expertise yeah. with, you know, chat GPT now has the option where you can do like personalized or customized uh, responses. I've been playing around with this. And so, um, you know, of course, Taylor Swift in the Eros tour being ubiquitous, I tried out having chat GPT have to respond to me in the voice of Taylor Swift to see like, you know, what does it actually know about Taylor Swift? And I could see for today's teenager, again, like, is this really in the style, in the voice of? So maybe even just picking somebody from popular yeah. culture who they know really, really well. Um, you know, the other one that mm -hmm. I think, you know, talking about bias, asking chat GPT to speak in the voice of a 15 year old. If you teach 15 year olds, mm. what assumptions is it making about you? Um, but I love your point about the way you speak. Yes. I love that. What you think? Yeah. Um, but I think your point about making sure we talk about why are we calling it hallucination? And mm -hmm. again, making sure that, um, when we're referring to the output, as you did earlier, Dimitri, that we're not humanizing this, right? This is still a tool because I think it's so critical right now that students are getting the message like, our emotional literacy is an incredible force. It's such a great power. And not to feel like this is smarter than you, this is more creative than you. This is a great tool for you to use to build on your schools. But I, I think we really want to make sure that students are not feeling like their humanity is diminished in any way, shape, or form. And a, an exercise that I'm, I'm actually borrowing this um, Megan O'Glebe wrote a great book called God, Human, Animal, Machine, all about AI and the metaphors that we use with technology. And in the book, she points out that it is almost impossible to describe the inner workings of like thinking for humans without having it sound like we're talking about technology. Just how even now I would say something <laughs> like, oh, wait, I'm processing your question. Um, mm. So I think it's really, it's great to have a, a conversation with students about the way in which we describe our engagement with the tech and why we've decided to describe it as such is another, you know, as you said, if we're thinking about agenda and bias, um, 
the language that we use, right, is a great thing to investigate. And I, I just kind of love that as a, how are you talking about your tech? Um, you know, mm. have you given your phone a nickname? Uh, and just, again, how quickly even the verb to Google um, came about. I think those language shifts are really, really interesting to think about. So thank you so much. Um, I know that Civics has lots of other programs. I don't know if you want to leave listeners with anything else you'd like them to um, remember about the organization and, and how they can connect with it, what other opportunities there might be to partner with Civics this year. Sure. Yes, yeah, so we do. We run a range of programs. Um, if you are in Canada, we have kind of more programs open to you because a lot of them have to do with kind of Canadian politics. We run our, our flagship program is called Student Vote, which is a parallel election that we run um, with every municipal, almost every municipal, provincial and federal election in, in the country. Um, we also have programs where we put you in contact with um, your elected representatives. Um, but if you are outside of Canada, um, you know, Polytox and Control F are um, there is there is some Canadian content in there, but they are not exclusively exclusively Canadian. Everything is free for anybody, um, so all of that can be found on civics.ca. Civics spelled C I V I X. Um, you can also follow us at civics underscore Canada. Um, and you know we run a, a bunch of professional development um, days in Canada, but we also have a bunch of virtual workshops that anybody any educator is free to attend for free. And those the virtual workshops are around Polytox and Control F. So if you're interested in those, um, you can go to the civics.ca and find that information. Or if you can't find it, just um, shoot us an email at hello at civics.ca. Yeah. I also like that if it's focused on mostly Canadian politics, it's sometimes easier, say, as an American teacher mm. to use Canadian, right? We're not bringing our political thing, mm. our political system into, but saying, hey, we're going to look at this through the Canadian political lens because it's so politicized right now in, in, in many mm -hmm. places here in the U.S. that sometimes it might be easier to have these conversations as a teacher to say, oh, we're going to look at this through the Canadian politic lens or the Australian politic, like pick mm -hmm. a country and do it that way to keep your own, uh, you know, to keep the politics of, of your country out. So it might actually be a benefit, Dimitri. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we, yeah, we know we and our, our like teachers work do that all the time with American content because, yeah. so yeah, it's a, it's good to reciprocate that. Yeah. We're all dealing with the same problems. Yeah. Well, that's Dimitri, great. thank you again so much for your time. Your piece in Crest, again, that's the Center for Research and Evidence on Security Threats. The title of that is What Kind of Digital Media Literacy Building Student Resilience to Misinformation Through Evidence-Based Approaches. Folks, I'd really encourage you to check that out too because I think it's a really good reminder of the ways in which we are engaging students with media and information literacy to what extent? Are they evidence-based? And how do we know? It's a really provocative piece. We'll be sure to include that link in the show notes as well. Awesome. Dimitri, thank you for taking time uh, here with us today. Again, we'll have everything uh, over there in the show notes, all the links. So you can go to civics.ca and all the other resources there to connect with Dimitri and the people at Civics. Thanks, Dimitri, for the time today. Thank you so much for inviting me. 